And we're back with part two of this week's reading through the Messianic Jewish Family Bible, Tree of Life Version, TLV. This is the Bible study for Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA. We are completing the book of John today, reading chapters 11 through 21. And we are about to begin chapter 15. Abiding in the Vine I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit he trims so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. The branch cannot itself produce fruit unless, it's ab- unless it abides on the vine. Likewise, you cannot produce fruit unless you abide in me. Very important passages there. I am the vine, you are the branches, the one who abides in me, and I in him him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and is dried up. Such branches are, are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. In this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Now I have called you friends, because everything I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I selected you so that you would go and produce fruit, and your fruit would remain. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. These things I command you so that you may love one another. The world hates God's own. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But you are not of the world, since I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore the world hates you. We are in the world, but not of it when you are born again and saved, and you're part of the family of God. Remember the word I spoke to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will keep, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for the sake of my name, because they do not know the one who sent me. They don't know God, in other words. If I had not come and spoken to them, They would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me also hates my father. If if I had not done works among them that no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and have hated both me and my father. So is fulfilled the word written in their scripture. They hated me for no reason. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. In in Leviticus 19, um, verse 18, it says, you must keep my statutes. I'm sorry, 18 says, you are not to take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am Adonai. And this is exactly what um, Yeshua is is saying here as well um, to the disciples. Chapter 16, I have spoken these things to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will throw you out of the synagogues. Yes, an hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. 
and they will do these things because they have never known the Father or me. But I have spoken these things to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. I did not tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. The Ruach reveals truth. And now I am going to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking me, where are you going? Because I have spoken these things to you. Grief has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And this helper, of course, is the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment concerning sin, because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will no longer see me, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Yes, the devil has been judged and condemned. I still have much more to tell you, but you cannot handle it just now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will tell you. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the father has is mine. For this reason, I said the Ruah will take from what is mine and declare it to you. There is a reference, um, Psalm 35, verse 19. Do not let my deceitful enemies gloat over me without cause, nor let those who hate me for nothing wink an eye. And Psalm 69, verse 5. Those who hate me without a cause outnumber the hairs of my head. Powerful are my enemies who would destroy me with lies. What I did not steal must I, must I restore. Death and resurrection foretold. A little while and you will no longer see me, and again in a little while you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by telling us a little while and you will no longer see me, and again in a little while you will see me? And because I am going to the Father, they kept on saying, What's this he's saying? A little while. We don't know what he's talking about. Yeshua knew that they wanted to question him. So he said to them, are you asking each other about this? That I said a little while and you will no longer see me. And again, in a little while, you will see me. Amen. Amen. I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will celebrate. You will be filled with sorrow, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is in labor, she is pain because her hour has come. When she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will ask me nothing. Amen. Amen. I tell you, whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give you up to now. You have not asked for anything in my name, asking you will receive so that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in metaphors. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in metaphors, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I'm not telling you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me, and I believe that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples say, See, now you're speaking plainly and not in metaphors. Now we know that you know everything and have no need to be asked anything. But by this, we believe that you came forth from God. Yeshua answered them, Do you now believe? Look, the hour is coming, indeed has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own, and you will abandon me. Yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have shalom, and the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world.
And there's a footnote, Micah chapter 4, verses 9 to 10. Why are you crying out loud? Is there no king within you? Has your counselor perished so that agony has gripped you like birth pangs? Rise and give birth, daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you will go forth from a city. You will dwell in the field and you will come as far as Babylon. There you will be rescued. There will, there will Adonai redeem you from the hand of your enemies. And here we're talking about the Redeemer. What a type, a beautiful type and shadow there. Chapter 17, the Son glorifies the Father. Yeshua spoke these things, then lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, so may he give eternal life to all those you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one, the only true God, and Yeshua, the Messiah, the one you sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world came to be. Yeshua prays for his disciples. I have made your name known to the men of this world that you gave me. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. The words which you gave me, I have given to them. They received them and truly understood that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, not on behalf of the world do, do I ask, but on behalf of those you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one just as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the son of destruction, so that the scripture would be, be fulfilled. He's speaking of Judas. Judas. Iscariot. But now I am coming to you. I say these words while I am still in the world so that they may have my joy made full in them. I've given them your word and the world hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Make them holy in the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I make myself holy, so that they also may be made holy in truth. Interceding for all believers, I pray not on behalf of these only, but also for those who believe in me through their message, that they all may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, so also may they be one in us so the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them as you loved me. Father, I also want those you have given me to be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world did not know you, but I knew you, and these knew that you sent me. I made your name known to them, and will continue to make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. So this is when Yeshua prayed for the disciples, and he prayed for the world. Psalm 41 Verses 9 and 10 um, prophesy here um, about Yeshua and what he's saying here as well. Something evil was poured into him. He will not get up from the place where he lies. Even my own close friend who, whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. So he's talking about, uh, about uh, Judas here, Judas of Iscariot. 
betrayed and arrested when when Yeshua, this is chapter 18. When Yeshua had said these things, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judah, who was betraying him, also knew the place, because Yeshua had often met there with his disciples. So Judah, having taken a band of soldiers and some officers from the ruling Kohanim and Pharisees, comes there with lanterns, lanterns, torches, and weapons. Then Yeshua, knowing all the things coming upon him, went forward. He said to them, who are you looking for? Yeshua had Nazareth, Yeshua of, of Nazareth. They answered him. Yeshua tells them, I am. Now Judah, the one betraying him, was also standing with them. So when Yeshua said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. So again, he asked them, who are you looking for? And they said, Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua answered, I told you I am. If you're looking for me, let these men go their way. This was so the word would be fulfilled that he spoke. I did not lose one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the servant of the Kohen Gadol and cut off his right ear. Now the servant's name was Malchus. So Yeshua said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup the father has given me, shall I never drink it? So interrogated and tried. Then the hand of the soldiers with the captains of the uh, of officers of the Judeans, with the captain of and the officers of the Judeans, seized Yeshua and tied him up. They led him first to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the Kohen Gadol that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Judean leaders that it was better for one man to die on behalf of the people. Simon Peter was following Yeshua with another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the Kohen Gadol. So he went with Yeshua into the court of the Kohen Gadol. Peter was left standing outside by the door. So the other disciple who was known to the Kohen Gadol went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. The maidservant at the door says to Peter, aren't you one of this man's disciples too? He says, no, I'm not. The servants and officers were standing around a fire they had made because it was cold and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. The Kohen Gadol then questioned Yeshua about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Yeshua answered them. I always taught in the synagogues and the temple where all the Jewish people come together. I spoke nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who have heard what I spoke to them. Look, they know what I said. When he said this, one of the officers standing nearby gave Yeshua a slap, saying, Is that the way you answer the Kohen Gadol? Yeshua answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, give evidence of the wrong, but if rightly, why hit me? Then Anna sent him, still tied up to Caiaphas, the Kohen Gadol. Now Simon Peter was standing outside and warming himself. So they said to him, Aren't you one of his disciples too? He denied it and said, No, I'm not. One of the servants of the Kohen Gadol, a relative, of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. Then they led Yeshua from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was early. They themselves did not enter the Praetorium, so they would not become unclean, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered, if he weren't an evildoer, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Then Pilate said to him, Take him yourself and judge him by your Torah. The Judean leaders responded, We are not authorized to put anyone to death. This happened so that the word Yeshua spoke would be fulfilled, signifying what kind of death he was about to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium, called for Yeshua and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you saying this on your own? Yeshua answered, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and ruling Kohanim handed you over to me. What have you done? Yeshua answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I wouldn't be handed, handed over to the Judean leaders. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So Pilate said to him, are you a king then? Yeshua answered, You say that I am a king, but
For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, so that I might testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went out again to the Judean leaders. He said to them, I find no case against him, but it's your custom that I release someone for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Not this one, but but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a revolutionary. So where they had taken him was the Roman governor's uh, Jerusalem residence. Chapter 19, Bound and Sentenced. Then Pilate took Yeshua and had him scourged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and slapping him over and over. Pilate came out again. He said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Yeshua came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Behold the man, Pilate said to them. When the ruling Kohanim and officers saw him, they yelled out, Execute him, execute him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and execute him, for I don't find a case against him. The Judean leaders answered him, We have a law, and according to the Torah he must die because he claimed to be Ben Elohim, the son of God. When Pilate heard this word, he became even more fearful. He went into the Praetorium again and said to Yeshua, Where are you from? But Yeshua gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You aren't speaking to me. Don't you know that I have the authority to release you, and I have the authority to crucify you? Yeshua answered, You would have no authority over me if I hadn't been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has has the greater sin. Pilate tried to let him go after this, but the Judean leaders cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Yeshua out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place called the Stone Pavement. But in Aramaic, it's called Gabatha. G-A-B-B-A-T-H-A. It was the day of preparation for Passover, about the sixth hour, and Pilate said to the Judean leaders, Behold your king. They shut it back, Take him away, take him away, execute him. Pilate said to them, Should I execute your king? The ruling Kohanim answered, We have no king but Caesar. Finally, Pilate handed Yeshua over to be crucified. And crucifixion was the, the method the Roman method of execution um, in that day. And the Judean leaders were going back to um, um, a law, um, and we're going to go look at this right now. Leviticus 24, um, verse 16. Whoever blasphemes the name of Adonai must surely be put to death. The whole congregation must stone him, the outsider, as well as the native-born when he blasphemes the name is to be put to death. So they were actually accusing Yeshua of blaspheming the name of Adonai, which he was not. Uh, but they didn't get it. You know, again, uh, their eyes were made blind um, to the truth. A sacrificial death. Then they took Yeshua. He went out carrying his own crossbar to the place of a skull, which in Aram- Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Yeshua in between. Pilate also wrote a sign and put it on the execution stake. It was written, Yeshua of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many Judeans read this sign because the place where Yeshua was executed was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The ruling Kohanim of the Judeans were saying to Pilate, Don't write the king of the Jews. But that he said, I am king of the Jews. What I have written, I have written. Pilate answered. So the soldiers, when they executed Yeshua, took his outer garments and made four parts apart for each soldier. They took his tunic also, but it was seamless, woven top to bottom in one place. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. This was so the scripture would be fulfilled. They divided my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. And it was in Psalm 22, verse 19. They divide my clothes among them 
and cast lots for my garment. So we're going back and forth to show the fulfillment of scripture. Buried in a rich man's tomb. I'm sorry. I kind of go back. back. I actually went and uh, went back to the to Psalms 22. Um, we're going to complete this this section here. The sacrificial death, standing near the execution stake of Yeshua, where his mother, his mother's sister, Miriam, the wife of Clopas, and Miriam from Magdala. Yeshua saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. He tells his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he tells the disciple, behold your mother. From that very hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Now, this was John, of course. Um, after this, when Yeshua knew that all things were now completed to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So they put a sponge soaked with the sour wine on a, on a hyssop branch and brought it to his mouth. When Yeshua tasted the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It was the day of preparation, and the next day was a festival, Shabbat, so that the body should not remain on the execution stake during Shabbat. The Judean leaders asked Pilate to have the legs broken and to have the bodies taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and then the other who had been executed with Yeshua. Now when they came to Yeshua and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. He who has seen it has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth so that you may you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not a bone of his shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. And concerning the Passover lamb, we have a passage way back in Numbers, um, Numbers chapter 9, verse 12. They are not to leave any of it until morning or break any bones. When they celebrate Passover, they are to observe all its regulations. And this is why um, the Judean leaders were asking that the bodies be taken off of the execution stake because... Of this of, of, of this passage here um, and then we have some more Exodus chapter 12 verse 46 it is to be eaten inside a single house you are not to carry the meat out of the house nor are you to break any of its bones there's some more footnotes here Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 then I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and supplication when they will look toward me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And we know that Yeshua was the only begotten son of God the Father. Psalm 34, verse 21 he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil kills the the wicked. Those who help those who hate the righteous will be held guilty. And in Psalm sixty nine Scorn has broken my heart, though I am sick, I looked for sympathy, but there was none, for comforters, but found none. They put gall in my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. So those are the scriptures that are in the footnotes. Very interesting, huh? Buried in a rich man's tomb. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take Yeshua's body away. Joseph was a disciple of Yeshua, but secretly for fear of the Judean leaders, Pilate gave permission. So Joseph came and took the body away. Nicodemus, who had first visited Yeshua at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Yeshua and wrapped it in linen with the spices, as is the Jewish burial custom. Now in that place where he was executed, there was a garden. In the garden was a new tomb where no one 
had yet been buried because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby. They laid Yeshua there. That was also prophesied. Now a Roman pound is 12 ounces and 100 Roman pounds is equal to 75 pounds. And here we go in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9. His grave was given with the wicked and by a rich man in his death. So he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Chapter 20, the Lamb of God is resurrected. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it is still dark, Miriam from Magdala, and we know her as Mary of Magdala, of Magdala, comes to the tomb. She sees that the stone has been rolled away from the tomb. So she comes running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Yeshua loved. She tells them they've taken the master out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out, going to the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and arrived at the tomb first. Leaning in, he sees the linen strips lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter comes following him, and he enters the tomb. He looks upon the linen strips lying there, and the face cloth that had been on his head. It was not lying with the linen strips, but was rolled up in a place by itself. So then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also entered, he saw and believed, for they did not yet understand from scripture that Yeshua must rise from the dead. So the disciples went back to their own homes. The way those burial cloths were were folded uh, was a message given that I am returning again. Yeshua appears to Miriam, but Miriam stood outside the tomb weeping. As she was weeping, she bent down to look into the tomb. She sees two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where Yeshua's body had been lying. Woman, woman why are you crying? They say to her. She says to them, because they took away my master and I don't know where they put him. After she said these things, she turned around and she sees Yeshua standing there, yet she didn't know that it was Yeshua. Yeshua says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Thinking he's the gardener, she says to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I will take him away. Yeshua said to her, Miriam, Turning around, she, she says to him in Aramaic, Raboni, which means teacher. Yeshua says to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet gone up to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I am going up to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Miriam from Magdala comes, announcing to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, and what he had said to her. Yeshua appears to the disciples. It was evening on that day, the first of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Judean leaders. Yeshua came and stood in their midst, and he said to them, Shalom Aleichem, peace I bring to you. After this, after, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Yeshua said to them again, Shalom Aleichem. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after he said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, Receive the Ruach HaKadosh. If you forgive anyone's sin, they are forgiven. But if you hold back, they are held back. One of the twelve Thomas called, the twin, was not with them when Yeshua came. The other disciples were saying to him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied to them, Unless I see the nail prints in his hands and put my fingers into the mark of the nails and put my hands in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Yeshua comes, despite the locked doors, he stood in their midst and said, Shalom Aleichem. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Yeshua said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are the ones who have not seen and yet have believed.
and he was prophesying also about us in the future. The reason for signs and wonders, Yeshua performed perform many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things have been written so that you may believe that Yeshua is Mashiach ben Elohim, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So there were many other signs and wonders that he performed, but there were too many to actually put here uh, inside, you know, in, in this gospel is what John is saying. But the ones that are put in here are to glorify uh, God and Yeshua. Shalom Aleichem. We mentioned this statement um, several times as peace to you. I'm going to pause it here and come back with part three.